we could invite our Nordic panel in to join me on the stage. Uh, this is a region of the world that I've fallen in love with over many years. I've been to all five Nordic countries a number of times. Uh, so the five Nordic countries are Finland, thanks Karina, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland. And by the way, just FYI, Iceland and Finland are not in Scandinavia. Iceland and Finland are Nordic, not Scandinavian. And you know, when you're in the family, you got to make sure, you know, you understand where everybody sits at the table and who everybody is, right? Because feelings can get hurt. Uh, but it is kind of a pretty functional little family. You have your issues, but you kind of all get along pretty well up there. And it's a fabulous place to visit. So welcome to Twin Impact. Trules, you've been a partner and a friend, I don't know, a decade maybe. Uh, you've come to this. We've been in Napa Valley together. We've been obviously in Norway. We've been in Israel. We've been a whole bunch of places together. We have. So here's what I'd like to do to start. I would like to ask briefly each of our panelists to give us an idea of what's, what's your purview in this Nordic phenomenon. So Trules, we'll start with you. Okay. First of all, it's great to be here. And, um, and uh, you know... My background is that I used to uh, start IT companies. So I started 14 IT companies, uh, but I kind of always saw that the largest potential for innovation was never really, uh, it was never really there to be harvested in the right way. So uh, after some time, I really got around to, to start this Open Innovation Lab of Norway, where we currently have more than 50 of Norway's leading innovative companies getting together trying to become smarter, because none of us is as smart as all of us, which, by the way, is a Japanese proverb, but we uh, kind of stole that. Arigato. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, so also, just to point out, uh, when Trul said it was difficult, he was, he was one of the earlier people to build a company, sell it very successfully, and say, now I want to give back, and I want to be you know, in the middle of helping make Norway and the Nordic region uh, uh, sustainably innovative into the future. So, Maria, give us a sense. We learned a little bit last night from your uh, trust exercise, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tell us about the, the Nordic Network for Electric Aviation, your role. Yeah, and so I'm the, the project manager for the network. And my introduction in, into electric aviation and also to, to sustainable aviation, if you could ever call it sustainable, uh, started about the same time as it started in, in the Nordics in 2014 with sustainable aviation fuel, SAP. We were among the first in the world to travel on SAP. And then in, in 2018, we started with electric aviation and now more and more also hydrogen uh, aviation. And, and it's important that we look into all these uh, different technical solutions because it's, it's not a technical solution as such. It's actually the system transformation to a more sustainable global world, a new way of transport, I would say. Yeah. So, so that's what we are actually uh, working with and system innovations. And as a Swede, are you comfortable sitting with three Norwegians? <laughs> I am. Okay. My father is Norwegian, so he ah, taught me okay. where my yeah. heart is. Okay, all right. Some <laughs> of my answer. best friends are Norwegian. Okay, great. Ingvar. Yes, yeah, so, so what I try to do is to uh, listen to weak signals from the future and try to convert that into something technological, tangible, so that we can shape the future in a, in a more sustainable and, and human-centric way, basically transcend into the future. Yeah. Um, basically also trying to uh, look different at things. When most people yeah. see ducks, we're looking for rabbits. That's what my, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what my t-shirt says. <laughs> well, so in Ingvar, in addition to your, your role with a ZZ Top cover band, you, uh, <laughs> you, also, you also lead innovation and digital for DNB Bank, which is the largest bank in Norway. Yep. Great. Thanks for being here. And he's a great saxophone player, too. Uh, professor, tell us about professor. your purview. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much for, for inviting us. Uh, I'm coming from a business school in Norway and uh, we're working on uh, innovations and we have a mentor in the business school that um, together for sustainable value creation. So as a response to the business, we created, a, I just created a, a huge uh, or a large area research center funded by business. 
with the idea of generating research into the area of innovation so we can get more out of innovations. And so from a business school, that fits very nicely working together with business and, uh, and solving real problems. So that's my perspective. Yeah, and we'll come back to this in a minute. I'm going to play a video to sort of an overview that uh, they've brought with them. But one of the learnings that I've taken from the Nordic region is how, and, and it really is true, how much real collaboration there is between government, private sector, universities. We can always be better. But there's an active, eager effort to try and continue to be better at that sort of cross-sector collaboration. So let's, uh, let's roll the video. I don't know if I can advance that. There we go. The world is changing. The Nordic region, jointly the world's 11th largest economy, is changing. Norway is changing. Will we adapt or be left behind? The reality is harsher. The questions are tougher. Never has our ability to innovate been more crucial to cultivate. Our ability to collaborate intelligently, more important, and our ability to create new value, more key to survival. Norway, with only 5.5 million people, is consistently number one in the UN Human Development Index ranking. Norway is Europe's largest fisheries and aquaculture nation, Europe's largest oil producer, and the world's third largest gas exporter. That has made Norway the owner of the world's largest fund, with investments spread across most markets, countries, and currencies in more than 9,000 companies globally. At Open Innovation Lab of Norway, we know that having the mindset, skill set, and tool set is important. We believe in the collision of human minds, and that the architects of the future are the innovators of today. With 50 of Norway's leading innovative corporations as members, we're creating added value and building the future. A future with fewer borders, more sharing, more collaboration, and more innovation. To learn more, please visit openinnovationlab.no. Or to learn more, talk to Thrules. So um, <laughs> thank, thanks for that, that context, but I'd like to uh, now move to uh, a, a question. Why do you think, what are a couple of the factors that have helped the Nordic region become fairly sustainably successful at innovating uh, and staying just a bit ahead. Uh, who'd like to start? Well, I, I can briefly start. And I also think that uh, Torun, as the professor, he was a bit modest oh. there because he's by far Norway's most yes. well-known professor in, in the area yes. of innovation. Uh, but to, just to start us off, uh, it's a bit by necessity, because you did mention it. You know, we, we are small countries by ourselves, and uh, most of the companies are small companies. So this uh, idea that uh, in order to survive, in order to thrive, you actually need to talk to the others. And, and also because we're, we're so few, we know each other also outside yes. of work. So this trust level is also helping us. There's an enormous uh, feeling. You can feel the trust and the openness. And people, also one of the things I value about the region is people mostly tend to say what they're thinking. <laughs> Good or bad. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, so there's this trust thing we'll come back to. But Professor, why do you think the region generally, and obviously we all know that there's a heck of a lot of money in Norway, and you've been great stewards of those resources and been uh, focusing increasingly on sustainable energy, as Maria is very involved with that. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the factors, aside from this, this wonderful uh, bounty that um, you're planning for the future? Well, first of all, we were just blessed by pure luck. We stumbled across an oil, and yeah. uh, we were smart uh, investing it for the future, and the future generations. So I think that was really, really smart. And we also created a rule of how much money we can take out of that fund to pump into the, to the, to the welfare state and funding of it. So we have like a... a, a model of society that just means creates very safety. People are, are safe and secure in the whole thing. So, and also that opens up for, for uh, cooperation between people and because trust, as you know, is just like oil in machinery. It kind of reduces the transaction cost and makes things easy and very easy. But I also find that the, in the business leaders are very open to share their thinking so they come to business schools and they share the thinkings, they invite for roundtable discussions, they put money on a table, can we explore these topics? So we hosted a roundtable discussion a couple of months ago and it was all about um, sustainability, transformation of the economy and being profitable in the same, e same equation. 
Right. But how do we solve that? How do we address that thing there? But also the coordination between governments in the region. So we have like a harmonization of the laws, regulations, uh, the culture is pretty much similar. Now that uh, two of the countries apply for becoming a member of the NATO, reduces cost of coordinating again. So it's like I see the whole region just becomes the 11th largest economy in the world. Mm. Right. Well, you mentioned convening. Uh, I, I've always thought, early in my career, I thought one of the best places to convene people for mm. trusted, third-party, rigorous conversations should be universities. And we don't do enough of it. In fact, a little bit of history, this organization was founded at the Kellogg School of Management specifically to do that. Mm. And here we are. And I'm, I'm grateful and happy, and many of my Kellogg colleagues are here. Um, but universities need to step up and get better at doing that. And, and with all due respect to my colleague and myself, it doesn't mean coming to the university to listen to me tell you how to run your business, right? It means we're acting as partners and facilitators. facilitators. And I've seen some of that in the region. Uh, it, it's refreshing. Uh, Truls, and then uh, not everybody has to answer this question, but uh, if you have something you want to add, please feel free. Truls. I also think that it's quite important, since we're here, to, to mention that we have uh, a, a social security net, which I think yes. is pretty good. Mm. Uh, so uh, you get, if, when you get a kid, you have like a 12 month um, parental. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to send my kids home with you, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> send them back after college. Well, you, you saw the pictures, you should come yourself. Yeah, it's, I know, it's I nice. know. <laughs> and, but, but the thing is that also the employers and the employees are, are kind of mostly working together. It's kind of, we, we found out that uh, the employers need the employees and uh, that that works quite well. We're finding well for that us. out again here in the US. And, but and, and keep in mind one more thing. Yeah. Five, no, sorry, four out of the five Nordic countries is now run by women. So, yes. um, well, that's the key. Well, but I want to I, I actually challenge, not the woman part, no <laughs> challenge there. Um, I want to challenge this notion of, of safety, of security and safety, which is absolutely true. I mean, mm. you, you feel it. But isn't there, you and I have talked about this a lot, there's also a downside to that. When, you, when you've got five and a half million people in a, I don't know, a couple trillion dollars in somebody's bank, probably DNB, um, <laughs> do you have the fire in the belly? Do, can, do people feel the threat, the challenge, the necessity to go out and take the risks and start a new business, to put it all on the line? How does that feel, how do we overcome that? And how does that feel in other parts of the Nordic region? I think that um, it's a good point, and, and we don't see, when there's not a lot of things that are broken in the society, you don't need to fix a lot of things. Right. So, but we see a lot of innovation on, or, or like bringing the society, uh, progress in the society on the society level. And I think that's, that's fueled by, uh, we're digitally advanced on society level, not just individually, like we have, you know, consumers don't use any cash in Norway, as you, as you would know. Uh, but that's also enabled by a digital society and higher level of trust. And, and if I can share a story from back in uh, March 2020, um, the Minister of Finance in Norway asked the question, when is, when is, when is uh, a lot of companies going to start going bankrupt, going out of business because of the lockdown? And the answer he got back was three to four weeks. So he had the cash and wanted to distribute that to tens of thousands of companies in the magnitude of billions of dollars. And his traditional government institution said that, well, it's going to take six to eight months to modify our systems. And uh, so, so, so we got the answer, can it be done in three weeks? Obviously, we had to look for rabbits when everyone else was looking, just seeing ducks. Um, probably we were blessed by ignorance. We didn't know all the reasons why it couldn't be done. And, and what we had to look for was, what is it that already exists on society level? Uh, if we just because everyone needs to trust each other now. So building in three weeks, building a fully automated self-service straight through, no human beings involved, solution in three weeks, for basically saving tens of thousands of companies with billions of dollars in cash support. Uh, that's only possible when you can, as, as, as a business leader, you can go to a portal you can be authenticated by something called bank ID that's run by the banks. Which had already existed before. Exactly. Mm, right. And I mean, the only possible uh, alternative to that would be log in with Facebook. Yeah. I mean, how would you enroll all those people otherwise? Yeah. And then there's another, once you know who the person is, you can go to a service 
that is run by the Department of Digitalization to see which companies is this person with that social security number have access to. And once you have that, you can check the account number that they're asking for money on. Does it really belong to that company? And go right. to the tax authorities to get the tax report. And you can, then you can just do calculation. It's not so even... the transparency and connectivity accelerated your ability to respond to a crisis. Exactly. And then in yeah. two, two weeks and six days, tens of thousands of companies were basically saved by billions of dollars. And to me, that's, uh, that's, that's transcendence in high trust societies uh, with uh, advanced digital um, uh, being advanced on the digital society level. Great. Uh, Maria, how does this look in Sweden uh, or other parts of the Nordics that you might have? Um, how, how is the entrepreneurial drive looking in, in the region from your perspective? Well, I, as, as you said, we do work together, both cross sectors and cross borders a, a lot as well, since we are small countries and yeah. we need to work together in the Nordics. Um, and you said, would you like to come to the university and listen to you? No, but we, we bring in the university. <laughs> See, uh, they say we, what they're thinking. <laughs> we bring in the, the businesses and we even bring in the NGOs. And then we yeah. sit in the same room and we say, we have a problem. Mm. We need to travel. We live in a part of the world where we need to travel. A lot of our business are abroad. And to keep our jobs in, in Sweden and the Nordics, we need to be able to keep travel or flying. Yeah. Um, but it's ruining our world. Mm. And we still want to go skiing yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and live in the nature and, and keep the nature as it is. So we need to find solutions. So then we need to get everyone in the same room. And when we do that, and we also create very bold goals together, um, like I talked about yesterday, the 2030 and 2040 goals for electric aviation. And that brings new industries like Rolls-Royce. They moved their um, uh, electric aviation um, research to Trondheim. Northvolt uh, are building huge battery um, companies in, in the Nordics. And so just by telling, sharing, and we want to co-create. We need the world yeah. to co-create together yeah. with us. And we do have a lot in place in the Nordics, like renewable energy, yes. uh, like sustainability on top of most people's mind. So, and the collaboration and trust in place. So we could be a test bed right. and, mm. and test out for the world. And, and, and it's also share. telling, Maria, that your organization is not called the Swedish Network. Of elect for electrical aid. It's called the Nordic Network, and that's, that's very active. It's not just a moniker. I'm going to go to the professor in a second to talk about measurement and how that relates to the, um, the conditions and the success in the Nordic region. But before I do, Tools, you have a point. Yeah, I just wanted all of you and the guys to understand that the, 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 the Nordic countries are collaborating on quite an extended level. So we have Nordic innovation here in the, in the room as well. And, and Nordic innovation is, is kind of, they reporting directly to the ministers of trade right. in, all the, in all the Nordic countries. Oh, and by the way, I so want to give a big uh, thank you to Nordic Innovation, uh, not only for sponsoring us here and being here, traveling a long way, but also early in, earlier in my career, uh, they, they sponsored, funded a, a major effort to uh, use a methodology I developed with Mohan Sani, a colleague at Kellogg, called the Innovation Radar. Yep. And we rolled that innovation measurement methodology out across all five Nordic countries, uh, 100 companies per country uh, over a two-year period. And it actually was an extra, I mean, that's like a dream thing for a researcher to be able to do that. And also, it was fun to go to the Nordic countries too and hang out. <laughs> and and, that, and that's when we met. the network yeah. as well yes. for yeah. electric aviation. So oh, great! The Nordic the yeah. Nordic uh, yeah. Council yeah. is yeah. great. So, yeah. Professor, what role is measurement playing? How how does that play? Well, it's so starting with um, that um, nine out of ten innovation ideas flop at the market. Um, Sixty to seventy percent or ninety percent of uh, fast-moving consumer goods are being withdrawn from the market one year after launch. Seven out of ten entrepreneurs are bankrupt three to five years after startup. So there's phenomenal downside to being an entrepreneur or being an innovator. So uh, what is going wrong here? You know, so, so we had to figure out how can we tap into the value being created through the innovations done by existing firms. So we, we sat down in 2016 and figured out can we develop a theory of how do we measure innovations, the value of innovations, seen through the eyes of the customers. 
And we start out there where you drink some beer and have some pizza, and one, and one year went, and we started testing it. And, um, and the whole idea is to link whatever innovations firms are in allocation of resources firms do to create value for customers, either through quality or through innovations. How does that make them attractive in the marketplace? And how do customers perceive that? And when you are perceived as attractive as a function of quality and innovations, then you would make a decision of going for A rather than B, because it offers you more value. And then you can link it to the cash flows. Then you can link it to firm value. So we right. started working with that idea, and we came up in a, uh, with a, an approach that is now is catching on. And we have it now in, in seven or eight countries, including the United States, operated by Fordham University, American Innovation Index. We have the Finnish Innovation Index, the Swedish Innovation Index, the Danish, the Belgian, the Spanish, and I'm flying to Australia now. Probably getting better than you in traveling now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> by Australian, Australian Innovation Index, which could be an option. And the whole idea is to create data on a standard of measurement instrument so we can collect a huge database yeah. so we can provide insight to businesses of what you're doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. Something similar to Harvard Business School's Profit Impact on Market Strategy project back in the 60s yeah. and 80s. Yeah. Mm. So to, just to help us understand what a business would do with this, it's, it's, so it's not about the prosperity of Sweden, for, for no, no, say, no. or Belgium. It's measuring something what, that businesses could leverage, which yes. is what? Yes. So most of the measures of nations' innovativeness, which is just have just ridiculous. I mean, nations cannot be innovative. People are. So just been taking it down to unit, another unit of analysis, I mean, how do people perceive it? And what are their willingness to pay for this thing? So, so it is a, an instrument that is a, it can be aggregated from, from customers to segments to the firm level to the industry level. And if you have enough money, you can take the national level. No, my budget doesn't allow me to do that. So we're currently we're in, in the, the consumer market, uh, just to develop the theory. And we covered, uh, we use data from the National Bureau of Statistics of how do people spend their household budgets? Yeah. And cover the dominant items there and saying that these are the industries, the categories that are important to households and thereby the welfare of people. And then we have the companies and then we start interviewing them. And we, I think we interview about 28,000 people every year on starting January 1st, going through the entire year, because I never know when you launch a new product. But when you do, I have data before and I have data after. Mm -hmm. So I can see the consequence. And, so, and also what's exciting about this is it's also in the context of the much larger picture. Because a lot of the research that, that we do for various reasons is, is focused on that particular phenomenon with these respondents. But you can now take that and put it in the context of yes. the, the, the whole society exactly. in a way. Uh, Trules, I'm going to give you a quick, and then I have to, because we're, we're running out of time, but I want to prep the three of you with a question. You guys always end up at, at, at or near the top of the global happiness rankings, okay? <laughs> Whatever the hell that is. But uh, <laughs> the global happiness, and, and Denmark's often there, the Philippines, by the way, Finland, and I don't know how many of you spend a lot of time in Finland, which I absolutely love, but as the Finns will say, they're relatively reticent people. In fact, the Finns have this wonderful joke, which is, how do you know the difference between an introverted Finn and an extroverted Finn? Anybody? The extroverted Finn looks at your shoes when he's talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yet, yet one, of the one of the happiest countries in the world. Yes. So yes. one brief note about why you think happiness seems to live at the top of the world. Maria. Wow, it's a, it's a big question, I think, in one way. But, but I do believe it is a lot about doing together and doing fulfilling things. Uh, and I, Great. like sustainability or we, we are right or wrong, but I do feel even if we are small countries, we feel like we are um, helping or contributing to the rest of the world with what we can do in, in our countries. And I think that's, uh, that's a nice feeling. Actually, you know what? I think that's a good place to end, doing fulfilling things together. Truls, do you have one word you want to add? Yeah, in, in, in Norway and in Open Innovation Lab in Norway, we're pretty, uh, we're pretty um, uh, happy with this word, combinatoric innovation, where we have the things from one company added to some uh, value from another company and then to the third, adding to that, and this combinatoric effect. Uh, and I think that's kind of the answer. Actually, that's a question. practical manifestation of what Maria just said. Mm -hmm. Combinatorial innovation, we can talk more about that after, doing, fulfilling things 
together. If you'd like to do more fulfilling things together with this region, talk to any of our panelists. And I will be, as I said last night, in Oslo for Innovation Day, September 1st. Yes. And any of you are welcome to come with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.